Now, it's my great honor to in introduce a great friend of ours at Wacom, Jason Shire, um, for his presentation, Behind the Process, Digital World Building. He's a fantastic artist, fantastic guy, and we love him very much. Jason, take it away. Thank you so much for the kind uh, welcome, Doug. It's always a pleasure to be here with Wacom and uh, to be here featuring some of my process. And so I'm gonna just jump right into it. Um, I'll share all my socials later and talk a little bit in the Q&A about any questions that you may have, but uh, we can just jump right in and I'll walk you through my process. So starting off any image or doing any type of design comes from uh, kind of going through the amalgamation of references and looking for inspirations. And for me, you know, Inspiration comes from a lot of different places. And I think that before I paint, it's always good to become intimate with the material that you're gonna be creating. And so for today's demo that I have prepared for you, uh, what I've been thinking about is a Japanese setting. Uh, there is quite a few amazing magical forests that they were using for uh, inspiration in my neighbor Totoro that I wanted to use for this painting today. And then also a lot of the folk house village style buildings that are in types, of, in types of settings like this. And I think it would be really interesting to feature a natural landscape with some you know, mountains in the background and some water and seeing some trees and getting that kind of evocative environment there to get the, the world to feel cohesive. So just to walk you through the inspiration images, we'll start with the first one. Uh, what I love about these these folk villages is the amount of moss and the layering of time that happens on these buildings. And I'm working on a personal project for many years now, and one of them is set in a village like this. And so it, I thought it'd be really cool for the audience today to take a little peek into my process and how I create images and the way I think about an image for a personal piece that I'm gonna be doing. Uh, and again, uh, the landscape has to tell that story. and so. Perhaps there is this like lake there that's been there for a really long time, perhaps centuries. And there's these man-made bridges that are being suspended with pieces of wood like you see here in this image. And I love that like kind of dark occluded forest in the foreground. Maybe we can even use that when we get into the latter part of the image. And uh, Yukushima Forest is one of the forests that I look at for an amazing amount of information because of the footpaths that happen inside and the amount of overgrowth. And there's even a sense of natural man-made, if you guys believe it or not. It's almost like nature is creating bridges and nature is creating tunnels. And that's the reason why Studio Ghibli and Miyazaki specifically looked at this as an inspiration for Totoro, uh, because Totoro's forest did feel like a little place that was built specifically for him. Uh, and, you know, there's this really great mossing and layering there too, as well. It's almost like nature is completely bespoking out what it's gonna be become for the future. So yeah, that's what I just wanted to walk you through what I'm looking at for the inspiration. Of course, some type of a windswept big tree line forest valley would be cool to have in the background. Um, and what I do is I grab my references and I create a palette because we only have a little under an hour today to do this painting. So I've created this palette based off of a lot of the things that I already have here. And so I'll have this up on the screen as I start to paint, just to see um, a visual kind of map of where I wanna go with my values and go from there. So first thing I do is get rid of the white canvas because nobody likes a, wa a white canvas. And you know I'll start um, picking my colors for my sky. And I know that uh, the best way to go whenever I've painted in the past is to just wash down uh, a lot of the canopy color that's gonna be affecting uh, the environment around it. And I think that's super important as a designer is to be mindful of that kind of canopy fill light that's gonna happen inside of the environment. So I'm going from background to foreground. So thinking about sky first, and I wanna have little area of saturation uh, and I'll zoom in here for you guys so you guys can see, but, um, and girls, uh, is kind of start to bring in some of that saturation on top of that cool desaturated blue, um, which I call like kind of the cerulean blue and a little bit of a teal. So that color palette does feel very, you know, Ghibli-esque and it feels like the watercolor poster paint that they use when they're doing these amazing backgrounds. And so that's my wash, that's where I start. And then from there, I'll call a new layer up and start to think about that landscape in the background. And so thinking about that, I know I wanna have 
most of the background kind of occluded by this large mountain shape. So just literally just putting in a, a shape here to kind of fill in that background gradation area. And I'll come in later and get my greens in. I'm just kind of washing in the global value of that BG. And then I'll do another mountain side here. And then on this specific mountain, I'm going to bring in some of these greens that I already have in my palette. And the great thing about the brush that I'm using is it has a little chromatic jitter to it. And so if you zoom in closely, you could see a lot of the variation that's already starting to happen and some of that texture in the underpainting. And that's something I like to do in my painting style is bring in a little bit of a natural tooth or a traditional feeling to the paintings. And I think it gives you a feeling of like, hey, this is actually painted by hand. And which it is, and I want it to feel that way. And I think that's super important as a designer to see the artist's hand inside intact. So the brushes that we've created here are very similar to that. And I know that I want to have that, like from the reference, that kind of greenish value uh, down on the water. So the water that's around this village is going to be this kind of green spring color um, that is very fanciful to the eye. I think it's very, it's a treasure for me because I love uh, the springtime. And I love when things are blooming and starting to grow. And it just gives you that feeling of like serene. Immediately I get that like serenity, right? And I think that's super important to get those kind of moods in your piece from the very beginning. Um, and I love that kind of like feeling of being bathed by green, bathed by blue, bathed by like those washes of warms as well. And so I'm starting to think about that even in the first pass, like the first stage of it. And so in the middle ground, so we've, we've done most of our background already, but in the middle ground, I want to start to think about um, the kind of main focal point, right? Where this like village is going to be. And so from the start, I want to think about shape, right? So um, I have a custom shapes tool that I created uh, and it's pretty simple. It, all it is is just uh, like random um, organic shapes that I can use to um, essentially just start to create landscape. So I'll show you how I, how I work it. And I'm not thinking about too much right now. I'm just thinking about just getting some random variation of shape in first, and then I can go in and then paint on top of that. And the great thing about these erasers is you can start to sculpt out of the eraser. And I'm going to leave that water nice and sharp. And now think about the layer above that where we're maybe we're connecting to the foreground a little bit. Perhaps from picture plane right or picture plane left. I'm just going to test it out and see. So let's go to a darker value. I'll fill that in solid. And I'm going to go ahead and flip canvas now. So what I like to do while I'm working, it's a lot like the old masters did, is take my canvas and flip it horizontally or flip it vertically. And what they would do in the old masters days is they would put a mirror up, like you guys can see my hand over here on the screen, and look in that mirror, and then they could see behind them if their painting starts to feel lopsided. And it's the same thing that I do digitally as well. It's kind of like an old Hudson master trick for painting. So that's cool. I think that's in a good spot there. And then what I'm going to start to think about is like some of that variation of the landscape now. So one thing I like to do is look at the reference and go, okay, like what's happening here? What is, what are some of the nuances that are happening here in terms of, is there some rock exposed? Is there some pockets of light and dark that are happening? Is there some occlusions happening on the water where it makes contact with the ground plane of the mountains? Uh, so that's something I want to think about as I paint. So let's just start with the tree line. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to start to noodle out on top of, you can see it's on this, this level and this level. So I'm going to start from the background once again. But in this one, I'm going to grab a tree variation. So going into my many, many brushes, I'm just going to grab some trees. Okay. 
And this is just a spatter brush. So I'm gonna just start to put down some shape for myself. And later on, I'll go back in and, and finesse this a little more. It's just to break it up a little bit because right now everything is so perfectly straight. And I'm gonna just put some color noise down. And I have a spatter brush here that I'm gonna play with to just kinda, of, I'm gonna zoom in so you guys can see what I'm doing and I'll put this right on top. just to kind of break up some of that straight with some organic texture. And I'm gonna go into my lighter values like you're seeing here and pull in some lighter values now. Some chalk texture. So as you can see, one of the things I like to do is layer texture so I can get a lot of variation quickly. And starting with that brush that we had from the very beginning, that's what's gonna give you that. That's what's gonna give you the quick style variations we need for this creating this environment, creating this mood that we need to have a sophisticated landscape rather quickly. And now I'm gonna to start to stamp out some tree shapes on top of that. So like just sampling from your palette that you already have in. So I'm gonna pull out so you guys can see the whole canvas and start to build in my shapes. And I'm not afraid, the great part about working in digital is I'm not afraid to just stamp right on top and then you can always correct it later if you make any mistakes or you're not liking the way it's feeling, but it's the, the best invention ever, digital painting on a Wacom tablet. And I'm gonna just start to add some variation right now. So what I'll do is I'll grab some different tree shapes that I've already created. And in the background mountains, I'm gonna start to bring in some of those greens. It's just a lot of stamping. And when you stamp it in, you can start to build it up with values. So darker, obviously, to lighter, lighter to darker. More saturation as it gets closer to the camera, because we're thinking about uh, re receding and also pulling forward. And as you recede values, that means you're cooling off the temperature cooling off the saturation, and, and that contrast is gonna automatically create a bunch of really cool flavor to it. So I'm gonna start spacing this out. I'm gonna go into shape dynamics. I'm gonna turn on size jitter, and I'm also gonna turn on uh, min minimum diameter. And you can also put on color dynamics in fact, background to foreground, and then you're gonna start to get more variation doing that. It's pretty amazing how fast you could work once you start to tweak your brushes and get this mapped in. I'm just gonna drag across, but automatically I already have a nice setting to get going with. And I know that the scale of these trees are gonna get smaller as it gets further into the background. So zooming out, it's already starting to take shape very quickly. I'm gonna flip canvas horizontal, look at it from this direction. And we're gonna switch back to the brushes here. And now I'm gonna to start to think about this, uh, this ground plane down here. And I have this rake brush that I'm using to kind of rake in, as you could see, 
sorry, I'll pull this over. I just want to make sure you guys can see the brushes I'm using. There we go. So now I'm going to start to bring in some of this warm value towards the foreground. Hue shifting. So we're bringing in some of that earthen color. And now let's start to think about that landscape where the village will sit. And then looking at the references, one thing I want to point out to you is the variation of shapes that are happening here, the height of the, the rooftops and the, the breakup of warmth against the cool. And so I'm going to start to think about that right now using my reference. I'm going to really exaggerate this. So it has that playful style that I put into my worlds. I want these roofs to feel humongous. I'm really playing with proportion. And so one of the things I do is I keep the ground level where the characters are going to interact at a, a very normal uh, height. And then what I do is like at the 60% mark, the 60, 40, I'll start to um, think about that uh, height variation to get proportion askew and stretch those variations of proportions, which is a lot of fun to do. And it really makes for a unique image, I feel. So pulling out here, I'm going to go ahead and scale accordingly. And things are feeling pretty even now. So what I'm going to do is take this building here and put it up behind. So it really like sets off from the main facade, the main face. Bring in some of that like warm color that you're seeing in the reference. I'm going to bring in a little bit of these greens now because I want this to start to take shape like the reference. I'm starting to sample some from some of the references too as well, which is something I highly encourage you guys to do. If you're going for a flavor profile that you want to get in your image, that's super important is to get that, that smattering or that sampling of colors that you already have to get you going faster especially with we're, when we're dealing with a very limited amount of time. And the great part about this is it's like just selections using the lasso tool and then slowly bringing back in uh, the brushes later. But this is how I work. I typically will make variations of shape selections to kind of create shapes quickly. And then you can get your paintings done a lot faster by doing so. And it's all starting from silhouette. If the silhouette works, it's going to work later as a painting and when it's rendered out. So everything is kind of facing towards us right now. And I want to take a cue from the reference again. And I want to have some of the roof shapes facing away from us. So you're seeing the sides of the buildings. And that's something I'm going to do now is as it gets closer towards the water, maybe there's a couple buildings where they're literally on their sides. And so there's going to be some smaller shapes. So I'm breaking it up big, medium, small, light, medium, dark, overlap and reveal. That's my cues. New layer, uh, new thought, right? You're going to see these like mossy rooftops. I'm going to bring in a little bit of those darker values at the bottom. And no, I, I know I want to have some areas of focal point. So I'm starting to grab some of the saturated green and bring it in so our eyes will start to kind of land in a specific area. And if we pull out uh, already, um, we're already starting to get uh, the feeling of the space 
rather quickly. And I love that part of painting is like, there's a subtlety that happens just by the beginnings, right? If the, the beginning of the painting is always the most interesting of a painting to me because you're, already, you're making these very important kind of crucial decisions that are gonna uh, equate to a final piece later. And if you make strong decisions in the beginning, it's gonna inform the rest of your painting and it's all gonna go better towards the end. So right now it's all about that breakup those panels and those planes that are getting those, receiving that bounce light and the contrast of the undersides of these buildings. Super important to get that stuff in there, guys. Guys and gals. I'm gonna pull out again. Sorry, one second, I pressed the Windows key on my computer, here we go. So pull out, kind of see how it's feeling, looking good. I'm gonna go ahead and start to gradate some of these values down here into the water. So there's like that reflected light that's happening from above. So what I do is I hit control shift C and then control shift V and it allows me to take this and transform it downward. And I'm gonna put this inside of the green layer and I'm gonna just set that inside and turn the opacity down. So it allows some of that reflection from the sky canopy from the buildings that I've already painted in to show. And later on, we can add some more subtlety and some more nuances later, right? So looking at the reference again, one of the things I really love is this kind of, um, these like man-made uh, planks that are going over, these, uh, these really cool kind of like vertical elements that are happening here in this image. And so I'm gonna start to bring in some of those shapes right now and just falling into the image and starting to think about that. And I'm not afraid to just make quick selections and think about perspective in my head because later on I can always tweak perspective to be correct. Right now it's about getting the mood down quickly and just getting the image down for you to see my process and the world building side of things. So I know there may, may be some kind of little piers here and some planks that are overlapping where the buildings are. And I'm liking the way the composition is flowing because the largest building, which is this one, is on my third. And that's something I always keep in mind is rules of thirds, right? If your eye uses that kind of golden ratio shape, it's gonna fall in line with what you're trying to aim for later on. And I'm gonna start to bring in some of these browns that I had in the building. And then that will lead our eye from foreground into background in a swooping shape. And it will also create a design language of color, right? So color language and design language are the same thing. If you can get those color languages to work in harmony with each other and have a family, color family to them, then you're succeeding from the very beginning. And I'm gonna go ahead and just bring in some dark darks in the foreground, just to kind of get the eye to say, hey, I'm here, I'm in the foreground, I'm getting inclusion. And maybe there's like something kind of cutting the side of the frame right here maybe it's a little piece of a mountain that you're kind of peering past that's going to give you that contrasted shape that goes i have a balance right so one balance is shape here shape here verticality from the buildings themselves and then now we could start to populate some of the smaller tertiary details after this point right and i don't want to hit that too fast that's something that i do later but i wanted to start to think about that so vertical shapes right we're talking about verticality maybe there's some tall beams around the village, poking out here and there. Maybe there's some flags or something. Let's make this one like extra tall, the one that's on the tallest building. Maybe this one is like ridiculously tall. And it has an organic quality to it because it's not perfectly straight. I want everything to be vertical, but kind of leaning on organic angles. And it just gives you that old world feeling like a full village, right? And one, one thing I was thinking about while I was painting this is imagine if there's these really cool kind of footpaths that kind of interlock between the buildings. So people can walk from one rooftop to another. And that way there's an inter-community kind of system that's happening, a culture of civilization that's been there for many, many years. And they've created this kind of layered cake of society on top of the society, almost like a little bit of a 
an ant's farm or a, a nest, right? And that way it's protected. And there's something really beautiful about that kind of that weaving together of architecture, that webbing together of, of design. Um, and if you look at it from a distance, it has that interest now. There's like almost like a roller coaster of inter interconnections happening now. And then moving into the drawing side, this is kind of fun for me. I like to switch back and forth between drawing and painting. Uh, one thing I like to do is just get like a pencil shape and start to think about the smaller tertiary um, details in here. So I think I have some selected. There we go. And just start to think about those smaller shapes inside. And I'm going to grab, you know, the edge of this building so it has some design inside of it. And I'm going to draw a little bit inside of this so you could see uh, the hand of the artist, right? So I know that the rooftop comes down on this angle. And I'm not afraid to just use a black value because I'm going to paint on top of it later. Maybe this rooftop has a dark underscore on it. I'm creating, I'm creating a no-tan read, which is a light and dark value read. And you can see when I'm drawing on my tablet, I just use the shift select, and that allows you to make straight lines rather quickly. And I'm thinking about these really cool uh, overlaps here. When this roof line intersects into another roof line, there's you know, that moss that's growing on top of this. building up over that time. And maybe it's starting to weight down on one side and then thin out on another. So I'm starting to think about thick to thins now, light, medium, dark, overlap and reveal, um, design, right? We're designing now. And I think that's the most important part of this being a good designer is understanding how all those principles work for you in your favor and just using them to your benefit. I'm not saying I know everything about design by any means, but I'm thinking about those things while I paint. So there's kind of a mindfulness that's happening in the drawing side and, and not just the shape design, but in the drawing part as well. So I'm kind of getting back into the draftsmanship part of it now. And you know, what would be cool is like, because I have all these straights now, in order for it to make it feel organic, I'm gonna start breaking up these edges now. And what that's gonna do is it's gonna allow the eye to see contrast of shape now from line to paint. And then we can come back in later on and start to really nuance that with the texture brushes. But in the uh, amount of time that I have in this demo, I wanna show you how my lay-in works. So you could see how rendering comes in later. And I could post this up online for you to see how I would spend another two hours on this thing and how much noodling and like finesse you can get into a piece to really make that piece uh, come to life, right? And then the wonderful thing about this is it's just gonna continue to evolve. It's, it, it starts to really tell you the story. It informs you as you paint it. And so, you know, like I was talking about earlier, maybe there's like some flags up top. And I love about um, Japanese flags is they're generally like a flat flag that's supported by pieces of wood on either side. And then they're like a great way for someone to put their house family, their crest or their, their um, clan on the top. And I think that's something that would be really interesting about this place is having that, those flags really like drawing your eye down into the image. I'm gonna start to bring some of that warm bounce light down here pull out a little bit, and I'm gonna rotate the canvas. And this is what I was talking about, is that lopsidedness that's happening. So what I'm gonna do is allow the eye to go upward right here, and then it connects with this value over here on this side of the building. And so now I'm starting to bring in light, dark light on top of the same environment. And just little suggestions of shape goes such a huge way now because of that time we spent in the very beginning creating the value structure, the overall scheme of how things are going to work. And now I could start to layer cake in some lines here. 
going in horizontal to contrast. There we go. I'm gonna break that up. Let me just clean that there. Horizontal lines go a long way now, like the verticals did. So again, contrast of shape, contrast of value, um, checking it in black and white now to see how the values are working. The value structure can be improved. And so what I'm gonna do now is play around with some gradations. So using a multiplier layer, I'm gonna go ahead and grad on this top corner to just darken down to keep the eye focusing in on the village. And now I'm gonna include the foreground out just slightly to bring the eye down in and we can bring the color back on and you can see automatically that's really working quite well. And now thinking about like some of the atmosphere, there's such a beautiful um, amount of aerial diffusion that happens in these kind of places. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna grab some of this cool value that I have in my scene. I'm gonna put up a screen layer and I'm gonna start to grad on top of this to just spotlight grad, to just push some stuff back now with aerial diffusion. And then I'll go ahead and kill down some of those blacks that were happening in the original part of the image where it was just the drawing part. And it would be really neat to start to bring in some warmth just over here at the top of the crest. Like imagine if there's a sun shining above and it's bringing some of that warm value down now. And you're just hitting some of the, you know, kind of kissing the tops of some of these buildings. And so much could be done by like a screen layer, just doing that and adjusting your curves to kind of get it to correct, color correct inside the environment. Save it out. So now I'm gonna go ahead and start to paint some of the textures that I was telling you about. So let's go into um, some of the, the texture brushes that I have. Let's go to the dot splat, because it's always a fun one to kind of start to break up some of these shapes. And this is on top of that same layer that we just created. Just to make this thing feel like it's really coming to life with texture. And I'm sampling from the lighter values now that are going to be on the base to make the eye see a different plane. Because we're looking at those greens on the rooftops and now we're looking at the greens on the ground plane. And I'm squinting my eyes down as I paint to kind of see light dark light values and then get the legibility of the reeds from a distance. And another thing I like to think about is like, for example, in this image, there's all these really great pockets of shape and color now that are happening in these um, forests. And so it'd be kind of cool to pull the eye through uh, using some of these browns. And so I'm gonna grab these brown colors and start to bring a little bit of that into here on these poles coming vertical. And it's also gonna create another value on top of the atmospheric value that we already have that I love. I like that that kind of um, play against uh, contrasts. And let's take a look at the, let's dissect what we're seeing here. So we're seeing a little bit of this moss collecting on the edge, but you see a bit of the thatch show up in the roof. And so now I'm gonna to start to bring up that texture here. So if I grab this, I'm gonna darken down some of these edges and bring in some of this thatch value. So now I'm gonna to start to create that contrast of the texture on the edge of the building. And then by selecting the values that you have already in your scene, you can create a, a bunch of gradations of texture. And just by tapping on this, it's gonna to start to create this um, pattern that I want that buildup of time on top. And I can go into here and then just go ahead 
increase my size, turn on my spacing. And you could do this a lot faster with the spacing on. Now I'm going to bring in some of that brightness, like some of that light is snuck onto the rooftop on the focal point, which is this building. And this is a place where you could start to really finesse, right? Because it's where we want the eye to go. And so we can start to increase the amount of contrast and uh, noises there. And it's just around that building. I don't want everywhere else to have that same intensity, but only here. Dark value in there, just to show the occluded edge. Pull the spacing back. Looking good. Flip canvas horizontal again, just to get like a fresh take on it. And now I want to start to get the lighting influencing the building in the proper way. And so what I'm going to do, let me go to my brushes, to start to think about these edges getting hit by the light from above. And let's bring in a little bit more of a warm tone, like actual light is influencing the local color. So this is called apparent lighting because it's being affected by light to the right. And so you're gonna to start to bring in some of these oranges, orange. And maybe right here, there's a slice of light happening right in front of the village. Just a slice. Good. Now, at this point, I want to start to bring in more warmth. So what I do is I'll go up to my huge jitter brush that I had at the very beginning of our demo. But before I do that, I want to start bringing in some bush shapes. Just to kind of break this up a little bit. Time is our enemy right now, so I'm trying to get as much info, info as I can at this moment to just so show you guys my process. And right now, I switch from using my Wacom tablet to my uh, my mouse. And I'm kind of old school that way, where I'll start clicking with my mouse instead of using the tablet. And I'll switch back and forth between painting on the screen to you painting with my mouse, which is like a weird rando thing that I do that still kind of still works for me. And I'm going to bring some of this pattern texture into the foreground because it'll help me group those textures together rather quickly and bring the language of the shapes together into the same image. And it's also this kind of amount of value that happens with this texture at the same time is what's making the painting feel like it's coming to life. And now I'm starting to like kind of darken down this area that's being affected by the lighting by just bringing a darker value green to show uh, where the light source is coming from and occlusions.
And you notice how I keep zooming uh, a bit in and out. I think that's very important for everybody to do is to just check to see how things are looking from a distance. Because if it works close up, it's not going to work far away. But if you work from far away, it's going to work close up. If that makes sense. For me, it does. And then just behind the buildings that I've already started to kind of map out, I'm going to start to put some patterns down just to kind of grade, gradate the textures from the trees to the forest like a sponge. So they start to marry together like they're part of the same world. It's like a pastel brush. It's working really well. Great. And then now I'm going to talk about that color variation I was trying to bring in earlier. So I don't get too super sidetracked. I'm going to put in a little bit of a foreground tree. And these are stamps that I've created uh, on projects I've been on that really help me get there faster when I'm trying to create mood rather quickly. I'm gonna pull this one out a little bit so I can still see a bit of that forest there. But that is such a nice little window now from a foreground area into a background area. That's something that I was really trying to get from the reference. And remember when I showed you guys the reference at the very beginning, this one is what I was talking about. And then what I love about this is these little dappled pieces of light that are bringing in um, that feeling of light source. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna double this up, flatten it, hit transparency, go into this brush. And then what I'm gonna do is grab some of this warm value that's in this and just hit a side of this like it's being hit by some of that warm light on the left side. So it really feels like it's working uh, with the light setup that we have going on in the painting. And you know, this is stuff that you finesse later. This is just getting the mood in. And then under an hour, we already have the start of such a strong base for a painting that we can really start to like define and finesse later. But in the amount of time that we had, I think that's an extremely successful uh, start. And I think that that's important to do is get that going as fast as you can so you can do all the rendering stuff, the fun stuff later. And now we could start to select and find uh, our textures by selections because we did a lot of just painting. Now we can really make hard selections and pull areas out, clean up our painting. Use a, a dry brush to kind of get in there and just two things up now. And now I'm really like, I'm starting to paint now. This is the fun part. In the last 15 minutes, this is where you really start to, to get busy. And 
and I'm gonna break up some of these edges down here. Rotate again, flip the canvas. And I want the brush to follow the shape of the rooftop. And that's something I'm doing now. It didn't, I didn't do that before because I was doing my lay-in, but now I'm starting to do that. So I'm following forward. So in the direction of the roof tiles or the, ha the thatching that's happening, you should follow where those examples are happening now on the roof. So this is the underside, so it should go in a horizontal fashion. But this is the top, so I want that to go in a vertical fashion, heading in a diagonal. So now I'm thinking and drawing and painting at the same time. And just kind of scoring over those oranges, we could bring in some of that orange color for color variation here and there. Like it's just getting sun-kissed slightly. And I don't want things to get too saturated, so we can always do some color adjustments at the very end. We have 10 minutes left. So I'm trying to think about ways to get a lot done for you guys here in 10 minutes so we could save for the Q&A at the end. And Doug, can you, if, if Doug, if you're there, how long do I have to paint? Just another 10 or do I have more time? Or anybody that's there from the Wacom team. Bueller? Anyone? They all they all ran away. No, I'm here. I'm, um, <laughs> all right, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, ten minutes is fine. Um, okay, you're, you're doing great, and then we have quite a few questions. So okay, great. Yep, yep. Thank you. And one thing I wanted to show you guys is like, so on these buildings, looking at them critically, there's a lot of um, warm value here on this front facade that I like, would like to bring back in a little bit, but also some of those contrasts of dark. So looking at the darks in here, imagine if we're just seeing slivers of dark underneath these rooftops. Now our eyes and to see these little windows into a world and fill in the details ourselves like oh cool there's pockets of darkness now that are creating contrast behind all that light and i need to see that for our eyes to see depth and i'm going in now and doing that i'm saving that for the end because that's the fun part right is getting a chance to put in those high detail contrast areas Now our eyes are punching. It's like a punch through the whole screen, right? And I want to start to get a little bit of like a, a light effect on the water. So what I'm going to do is create a streak, a shape of streak on, on the surface and make a new screen layer. Hide that. And just bring in a little bit of a light source hitting that water. And I'm going to go ahead and use my eraser and just carve on top to create some variation. And one thing I'll do is go into filter, blur, motion blur, and then just put it on an angle slightly. And there we go. Now we have that feeling of light hitting water because it's moving on that water surface. Any of some of those darks we were talking about. Pulling out, looking at the reference again. What I love about this one is it has this kind of uh, warm but cool feeling to the mossy water. So I'm going to bring in a little bit of that into my painting because there was something I was really drawn to that. And I'm going to put this on a lichen layer. 
and just grad upwards. So it creates a little contrast of the sky hitting some of that surface. There we go. And then what I'm gonna do is on the eraser, I have some texture erase brushes and I'm just gonna texture erase on top to create like distortion in the surface of the water, like if there's particles sitting on the, wa the water surface. And one thing I haven't got a chance to do very much of yet is start to add rocks. And that's gonna really help sell scale. And I'll do that at the very end, just to show you guys how I would continue the painting from here. And that's, this is how you tell the story. It's like when you start to bring in those rocks and ground plane coverage, that's gonna start to just sell the scale very, very nicely. So going into this brush, I'm gonna start to bring in that on a new layer on top. And I have these like great dot brushes I've created. Um, dots two and dots dotties. So like I have a bunch of dots that I use to kind of break up surfaces. And that will look like pieces of stuff floating on the water, on the ground. It creates scale. And I love that part of a painting because it's like those are the little tiny things that you can start to bring in that your eye will start to see detail. And then we're doing that in just the last four minutes for the sketch. And then if I was to continue painting this, I would add a lot more finesse to this and take my time. But, you know, we're rushing to get a lot of information down very quickly. But this is the same process I would do even if I had time, but in kind of a little bit more of a speed painting format. But look how much that adds just by putting in those dots. It's that tertiary detail we were talking about at the very beginning of the painting. It adds a ton. And I remember years ago, I was working um, on the third floor at DreamWorks on the Projects of Development Slate section. And I was working with um, amazing artists like Marcos Mateo and Paul Lassane and just tremendous talent. And I used to ask them, like, what is it about a painting that makes a painting into something different than a lot of the other artists do? And I said, you know, what do you think it is? And I asked all the artists that. And they would always say, it's like when you take out that very small flat at the very end of the painting and you put in that very thin whisker size line or those little subtle dots, that's where you see finesse. That's where you see something come really come to life in an image. And I was like, wow, that really makes sense. I didn't even think about that, but it's so true. It's just those subtleties at the very end of an image that people, it's what you do at the last part of your image that makes your image different from everybody else's too. And that's the finishing touches that I think everybody will start to grab in their repertoire as students or as professionals to have their own thumbprint in their own point of view. It's also the materials that you paint too. Like don't paint everything what everybody else is painting, paint your own subject matter, tell your own story. That's gonna also be a huge contribution to how you get to where you are as an artist. And then zooming out, like uh, looking at it from that distance, you know, in the last two minutes, just looking at that, that feels pretty solid. Just as a small thumbnail, like a postage size thumbnail, that feels really nice. And, you know, we can add in all this like little breakup of like maybe there's some small pieces of wagon wheels or pieces of rock. And those things that would come in later as I start to finesse the painting in the next like hour, if I had another hour to paint this. But I just wanted to show you guys the lay-in because this is the most important part of the painting. And adding all these little details and changing colors around is actually kind of the easy part. And I wanted to save like the, the meat and potatoes, so to say, for you here in this session. 
So you can gain a lot from that and really understand uh, what the process means and how we create images. So hopefully you guys learned a lot from that today. We can open it up to the chat now and I'm gonna stop sharing and then we can uh, jump into the Q&A and I'm just gonna turn off this, ca this camera too over here as well. Um, and then we'll go from there. So actually I'll just leave it. Yeah, there we go. So please fire away. Uh, okay, can you hear me? Yes. Am I? All right, great. Yep, you have a bunch of questions here. Um, uh, everybody's very excited about what you've been doing. It's great to see. Um, let's see, do you just create a new layer every time you need to add details instead of going back to layers underneath? Sorry, I didn't hear that. Oh, okay. Do, do you just create a new layer every time when you need to add details instead of going back to layers underneath? Yeah, that's a very good question. I absolutely do. And I think that if you're making a huge change to any of your imagery as you create it, it's a good idea to call up a new layer because say you did start noodling on something and you're not liking the direction in which it's heading, you can go back in and really gently pull those, extrapolate those details later if you don't like them. But if you're doing a big dramatic change like a lighting change or adding in some foliage or putting a new mountain in or a structure, it's always good to put them on a new layer. Great, thanks, thanks. No problem. Good answer, yep. Uh, what is your advice on how to avoid colors and details getting muddy, especially in compositions like the one you just did that are mostly the same color? Yes, and you know what? If it's analogous, if it's in a, in a locked gamut, so to say, if we had the color wheel and we just put our hands over a certain part of the color wheel and we were painting inside that color wheel, it's very hard to get muddy. It gets muddy when you say that they're muddy because colors can be controlled quite easily. You could you play with browns and paint in the muddy colors and still make an amazing painting. Some of the greatest painters of all times like Zorn and Sargent did that. They didn't really use very much color sometimes where it was almost like a black and white painting with like a swath of color. And so as long as you're controlling your values, your colors are gonna work regardless. So a good strong value system will make a great painting later on. Okay, good, yeah. Uh, another question, um, with your approach, Jason, um, is it hard to change major things like color and lighting? For example, this pic this this uh, scene you did looked like it was either early morning or late at night or getting kind of dusky. Um, uh, is it hard for you to change uh, everything back to like a super bright scene? You know, it's not. And I think it's, uh, it's all controlled with value. So going back to exposure, if you're using a camera, right, and you're looking through a camera's lens, there's a thing called f-stop and you stop up or you stop down. So stopping down means you're darkening down the image and then stopping up means you're exposing and getting brighter. So you could control that with overlays using a multiply layer or a darken layer or a lighten layer or a screen layer. And there's also a lots of other in-betweens like soft light and vivid light and linear light. And those will all affect using layer styles very differently using the Wacom tablet and Photoshop together. And I find that with these um, designs that we're creating in like an exercise like we did today, I'll screen share again for you guys so you can see. Um, what I'm focusing on specifically is just getting the legibility of the, of the image. So if it works right there in black and gray, like we're seeing here, it'll absolutely work you know, in color. And so if I toggle between black and gray and color, it works perfect. And that's something I want you guys to be confident about as you paint is it doesn't matter if it's a very limited palette and you're staying in the green values, but there's quite a bit of range in this image. If you look closely, uh, there's warm tones in here. There's like that earthened color. There's those warm kind of oranges. There's those deep kind of like pasty greens and uh, the yellow right next to it. There's also that gradation of value that's happening from the warm down into the cool at the bottom. So there's a lot of interplay between light and dark, and then the foreground darks to the background darks, as well as the interstitial values that are happening in the image as well. So don't be afraid to just mess around and see what kind of gamuts you can create just by doing that. I think it's super um, fun and inventive to do it that way too. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on the art theory being taught to never use black in a painting? You know, I think that's okay because, you know, personally, I use black in images 
when I want things to uh, feel dramatic, like a film noir, right? Black and gray is okay. But if you use too much black, what happens is you start to create black holes in your image. And it's the absence of color. And say, for example, you're looking at one person's monitor to another, it's always good to stay between the 10% in the brightness and then 10% in blackness. So if you look at this, if I sample my image, I have very dark blacks in the foreground, but it's not 100% black. You can see there's a little bit of room right here, wiggle room in the brightness. And even in the background, there's a bunch of wiggle room right there for it to get brighter. And then you have nothing ever goes 100% white. I think we save that very small teaspoon for the very end if we do want to have that high amount of contrast. But there's nothing wrong with it as long as you have your balances correctly. But I would say stay within here, like this range. Don't go any darker than that. And don't go any brighter than this, just so it can play well on other people's monitors. Cool. Uh, what is your favorite tool for making landscapes? Lasso tool, 100%. You know, I, I was, I think I was demonstrating that pretty well in the beginning is like just getting that lasso tool out and creating a shape just like that. I already created a mountain. You know, if I wanted to put a person in here, you could just put your toothpick man really quickly by using a lasso tool, just standing here in the foreground. And it's just such a great tool for drawing and making selections and filling in. And, and I just love how fast it goes. So I highly recommend as you guys paint, to experiment using this lasso tool and trying to find shapes doing that and then filling them in solid and then painting it side. Because you, you saw the power of that just by putting in the foreground shapes to the background shapes. If we go to the back to the beginning of the painting, that's the background shape right there. And we stayed within that auto automatically just by using the lasso tool. And then that shape, that water layer, and then all that like reflected light stayed within that. And then everything else kind of coming in between that. So absolutely use the lasso tool as much as possible. It's a very powerful tool. Great. So do you, do you go into painting, Jason, without a plan? Uh, you always seem to like just kind of develop something as you go. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, I like that part of it where it's a bit more um, organic. And, you know, if it's for myself, I could do that and experiment. But if I'm working on a project, and someone's paying me to do a piece and they have specific ground rules or criteria set up in place for me, I don't deviate too far from the plan. Because they're like, hey, Jason, you're designing this like crazy vehicle and this vehicle needs to have four wheels and it needs to have this shiny specular metallic paint on it. But in between, it should feel like a Bugatti mixed with a Ferrari or something. You know, So you have parameters. But when it comes to a landscape painting or world building, in the very beginning, when you're getting through the blue sky phase of something, shoot for the stars, like create wild shapes, have fun with the nuances there because later on you're gonna get a lot of people's putting their fingers in the pudding, so to say, and changing stuff on you and just go for it and go as far as you can because you can't pull back if you don't go far enough. I hope that makes sense. Uh, that makes sense, yeah, absolutely. Uh, what are some of your exercises for uh, improving lighting? Oh, that's a really good question. So what I do is uh, look at a lot of film. And also, this is it right here. Like, if I wanted to do an exercise on this type of a scene, I would literally copy this image and just try to nail everything without color sampling. And then the next time I do it, I'll color sample and look at where everything kind of ends up on here. So you can see... In the darkest darts, it, it's not 100% black, you know, it's kind of almost at 95. And then in the lightest lights, it does going into the, almost towards the whites, it's 100%. And that's because of the lens, the way the lens works is it exposes for darks or it exposes for lights. And so you're learning a lot about that. But we're, we're looking at a film, uh, i.e. a movie, you know, production designed or uh, cinematography done by a Wally Pfister or a Roger Deakins there's a sophisticated palette that's being created not only by the director, but by the cinematographer. And there's a lot to be learned there. And I think that's like in the limited palette that they use. Like if I think of like Blade Runner 2049, for example, there were scenes in that film where it was completely bathed in orange or it was completely bathed in the blues. And it's very monochromatic, but that's okay. And I think that if you can control your values really well, it doesn't matter what photo filter you put on top it's gonna work. 
And that's what I was saying, and I was trying to relate to you guys on early in the game, is when you're painting and you're getting color in, don't be afraid of the color. Just get your values to work solid because you could put a blue next to a green, next to a red, next to an orange, and they're all going to dance well together no matter what. And I had a production designer when I was working way back in the day at DreamWorks that said that to me. And he's like, hey, you could put the, all the colors in the rainbow. It may feel a little bit garish, but if your values are working spot on, then the colors are going to play no matter what. Cool. That's great. Uh, last question here. Uh, what do you find is the most efficient workflow to go from line to value to color? That's a good one. Um, so in terms of workflow, it's whatever you feel comfortable doing. A lot of people do start with drawing, and I think that's perfectly okay. If you have a solid layout, I call them layouts, because in the old days when I first started doing design, I was working with layout artists. And what that means is someone would do the drawing for you that you were going to paint. But that means that you have to be very methodical in your process. So again, creating something in the background and then moving into the middle ground and then moving into the foreground. And so what I would do is paint my sky and the background objects first, and then I would paint my middle ground and then I would paint my foreground and make sure that those are all overlaid. And what I mean about painting out what's behind is like in the old days, what we would do is we would parallax. And so if the camera rotates and reveals, you gotta make sure that you're painting all that information that's behind the, the object in front. And so like in the old multi-plane camera that Disney used to use on like Pinocchio and Jungle Book, it's the same philosophy that we would paint in a digital fashion. And a lot of times people are utilizing After Effects or Nuke or some type of compositing software to create the very similar identity in their process. So think about things that way when you're creating your process is if you have the line, that's just your basis to start your composition, but then go in there and dissect the shape. And once you get the shape, then you can start to bring in the rendering and all the detail. I, I heard this from a, a close friend of mine that's a production designer. Rendering is actually the easy part. It really is. If you really think about it, you're just noodling away at details, but you don't make everything the same amount of detail. Say if you're looking through a lens and you're focusing in on an object, and say, for example, this object is these buildings that we put in, you can keep everything else kind of looser, like what we're doing here. This is There's not any information in here whatsoever. It's literally a flat card. But if you get closer to the areas where we wanted to have those details, that's where the camera's in focus. The lens is stopping down on that object. And so everything else can kind of go off into out of focus, soft details. And that's something I would love for, to see from you guys in the future is to make that exercise. If you're doing a painting, to allow other things to recede and to get softer and just gradate in the background. And just like the background behind me, a lot of this area is just kind of a wash of shape, but in the area where I wanted the eye to go, like this building that my hand's on top of, and then these other buildings below, that's where I put the high contrast Notan read. So it's the same thing when you guys are creating an image is to, to do it that way, where you're thinking about how the camera's focusing in with the lens. Okay, great. Thanks, thanks for joining us today, Jason. It's been it's been a pleasure having you on. It's always great to see Absolutely. you. Absolutely. My pleasure.